Acts chapter 17. A man was shoveling snow in his driveway. Sorry to bring up snow at a time like this. When two boys came along with shovels and said, Hey, mister, can we shovel your driveway? We'll do it for $2. And he said, Can't you see I'm shoveling my driveway right now? And they said, Yes, sir. That's why we asked. We get most of our business from people who are halfway through and feel like quitting. And I'm sure that is true. I used to plow snow in in uh, Illinois, and if you saw my truck all rusted out, you'd see, you'd believe me about that. And everywhere I would go, just trying to help some of our members, shut-ins, things like that, um, people would be standing out in their driveways with the shovel in one hand and their wallet in the other, waving. I don't have time. I can't stop everywhere. Unfortunately, today, there's a lot of people quitting on God. But the Apostle Paul never quit, and he never gave up. After deliverance from an earthquake out of that prison at Philippi, most of us would have decided to go back home, but Paul and Silas continued preaching the gospel. That was really their first stop. That was their greeting from Europe, welcome to Macedonia, as they're thrown into prison, as they're put in the stocks. Uh, But they move here in chapter 17 on to Thessalonica and Berea and Athens, and each city responded differently. In Thessalonica, they resisted the word. In Berea, they received the word. In Athens, they ridiculed the word. And we can expect some of all those choices today as we offer the word. Uh, Let's talk about Thessalonica a little bit. Tonight, This city was located on the main highway connecting east and west in Europe. The main highway of the ancient world, it was called the Ignatian Way, and you can still see part of it here on the screen. It it connected the different portions of the Roman Empire, east and west, a strategic city, a capital city in Macedonia. It was a center of commerce, and so Paul knew if he could reach that city, he could reach anywhere. And that's what the church ought to strive to do, is be not just a local church, but a regional church, and that has fingers out all over the place trying to reach into other areas, disseminating the gospel outside of these walls, not forgetting our local community, but to regions uh, beyond and bordering counties and thinking about our country, our world. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. First of all, this is a good, historic, strong church that has had a lot of influence locally and globally through the missions program. Our missionaries, think about it, are paid staff members of the church, and they represent us in many other countries. We've We are personally blessed with unpaid staff members. Well, they're paid by somebody else through our website sermon ministry. There's tens of thousands that preach these messages in other places. It's neat. Go look up sometime a title of a message that you liked here, and you'll probably find it somewhere else and say, that really sounds like uh, something I heard. And then some of you will say, our pastor must have copied them. (laughs) But thankfully, uh, thankfully, they are wanting to use our messages. We want to be regional. We want to be local. We want to be global in what we do. And Paul wanted to do that. You know, he was only in Thessalonica for three weeks. And yet he founded a church there. And it was a great New Testament church during that time. And years down the road, he wrote his first letter to them. 1 Thessalonians 1.8, he said, From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. It, it spoke for itself. And that church started out of a riot. A riot. Paul was winning people to the Lord. And a riot erupted. Because when you preach the gospel, not everybody's going to like it. The devil constantly battling a Bible preaching church from without, sometimes from within, or both. Satan doesn't yield an inch without putting up a fight. Uh, Look at verse 
4 in our text. So we are in Acts 17. The first verse tells us uh, the towns and Thessalonica included there where it was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse number 4 says, Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas of the devout Greeks, a great multitude of the chief women, not a few. In other words, there was a revival going on. There was good things going on. And yet the devil used people to do some dirty work. Look at verse 5. But the Jews which believed not. Ah, there was people who believed, verse 4. And there was people who not only didn't believe, but they were angry. Verse 5. The Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain, I love this phrase, lewd fellows of the baser sort. Can you picture lewd fellows of the baser sort? What do they look like? <laughs> right within the room. I imagine leather jackets, maybe some sunglasses, a lot of brill cream. I'm not sure back in those days how they, uh, the lewd fellers of the, fellers, <laughs> the fellows of the baser sort would look. It says, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. A riot. Assault. Yeah. Did you hear about those two peanuts walking down a dark alley and one of them was assaulted? That's not in the notes. Probably for a reason. Um, assault happening here. A riot happening here. Even though people were believing and you'd think people would be excited about revival going on. Nope, nope, nope. Um, and the devil used people to do his dirty work. Be aware that he will use anyone. He will use any of us, myself included, even unwittingly to do some of his tasks. The Bible says not to be ignorant of his devices, that he works in that way. He can use me. He can use you. Don't let the devil use you to be part of trouble in a place that's preaching the gospel. And remember, if you're a leader, leaders are influential at the top of his hit list. A big bullseye on your head. You can't have a group of people and everybody agree on everything all the time. Not everyone will see eye to eye. And so we've got to be humble enough to say, as Jesus did, not my will, but thine be done. Well, that wasn't happening in Thessalonica. This passage says the troublemakers gathered together, these lewd fellows. They knew who to go to in order to garner agreement. I said they knew who to go to. Isn't it always that way? Troublemakers gravitate toward their own kind because they can always attract others who have an ax to grind, a sympathetic ear, people who will jump on board when the garbage truck goes by the garbage truck of grumbling and gossip and criticism. And so we've got to be determined as sincere, serious believers to say, I don't want to even be accidentally used of the devil to be a hindrance to God's work. I want to be a help to God's work. I don't want to be a discourager. I want to be an encourager. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I want to be a stepping stone for God's work. It's worthy. Notice what was said about Paul and his party, verse number 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, saying, here it is, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. So which way is up? This is an upside down world that we live in. Nothing is the way it's supposed to be. Nothing in America is the way it's supposed to be anymore, it seems. And our whole world is full of chaos and confusion. Our nation, which God initially set up as a Christian nation and prospered, is very much an upside-down place. But the whole world has really been upside-down since the fall of man, way back when. Paul was just trying to fix it. He was just trying to turn things right side up. He was trying to help homes. Trying his best to help homes be right side up. And punish sometimes for doing that. Yeah. 
Still today, Satan tries all he can to turn upside down homes of families, to make us not see each other, not spend time with each other, not talk, or when we do talk, it's negative, argumentative. He slips in financial hurdles, tests of relationships. We are supposed to have leadership in our homes, right? Well, we've got leaders all right today. There are phones and computers and televisions and video game systems. Homes. Paul was trying to turn things right side up. Young lives trying to turn things right side up. We've got a growing group of young people now on Sunday mornings meeting back there for Sunday school. Wednesday nights they are here. Uh, some of them are here tonight even. Satan will do all he can to turn our young people upside down. Upside down by introducing drugs to them and alcohol and pornography and the occult we preached on uh, Wednesday, a couple Wednesdays ago to the teens. He wants to turn homes upside down and young people upside down. They are the future. Churches upside down. We pose a serious threat to Satan's dominion, so we are his arch enemy. He tries to turn our hearts upside down. I know he tries to turn mine upside down. His goal extends to all of us in leadership. Don't act surprised when that happens. It's only smart. Take out the head. Take out leaders. God can help, though. God can help us turn the truck around, help us turn our world's right side up, turn wrongs into rights, Maybe it could be said of us what it says in verse 6. These that have turned the world upside down are come. We need to turn this world right side up. And it takes three things. According to our text, number one, we need to be reminded tonight, all of us, to exemplify the Savior. I sure need to be reminded of that. To exemplify the Savior. Paul exemplified the Savior in two specific ways in our text. One was in his worship. In his worship, he was an example of the Savior. Look at verse 2 in that phrase, as his manner was. Verse 2, Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. <clears throat> and three Sabbath days, that's in church, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Uh, that phrase, as his manner was, means it was his habit to go into the synagogue, into the church. And that reminds me of Jesus, Luke 4, in verse 16. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, as his manner was. You see that phrase? As his manner was, Paul's manner, Jesus' manner, as his custom was. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And so Paul is just being an example of the Savior in his worship. On God's day, he was in God's house with God's people, opening God's word, hearing God's message. You are too. I'm proud of you. Now think about this. Think about the churches Jesus went to. Imagine you're Jesus and you're going to, what kind of churches are they? They're, they're Jewish churches, right? They're synagogues. Look in the phone book in Jerusalem, independent Baptist. No. <laughs> Where's he going to go? Sabbath day after Sabbath day for his whole life and other days in between. And the Bible says in those days the Jewish religion had become a dead faith. So these were dead churches. Churches that had substituted ritual for relationship. They had religion without reality. Lots of sacraments and no spirituality. They're a dead church. On one occasion, Jesus said, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. You know he kicked over the tables there. Think about it. This means that for all of his life, the Lord Jesus attended a dead church. <laughs> and yet he was faithful. And Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How do you feel about it? This morning's message I mentioned was from our Wednesday night 
series. And some on their way out said, am I missing something? I didn't know you're giving stuff like this out on Wednesday nights. Hey, come out and join us. That's what we do. Hebrews 10.25 says not to forsake the assembling. We always focus on that phrase, don't forsake it. But look, as the manner of some is, Paul as his manner was, Jesus as his custom was. There it is right there in that verse. The manner of some is going to be to forsake. Well, I'm preaching to the choir tonight. The devil doesn't take days off, does he? <laughs> Nor should we. It's work to be faithful, but it pays to serve God. Now, this is not a little thing. The matter of faithfulness is not a little trite thing. To treat the holy day as a holiday, as the manner of some is, it's a bad testimony. We can be a bad testimony to our relatives. They come to town, tell them they're welcome to come with you. But as the manner of some is, as our manner is, as our custom is, we will be in the house of God. It's shocking but true. Some will give prayer requests for lost family members, but then when those family members come to visit on a weekend, they do the unimaginable and leave it up to their guests whether everybody's going to go to the house of God or not. You're not going to win your kin that way. Well, it's not only a matter of faithfulness. It's a matter of our testimony and our influence because we want to turn our world right side up. And we need to be exemplary in our worship, which is square one, the most basic building block of serving God. Paul had it down in his worship. Secondly, in his walk, he exemplified the Savior. Verse number four. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, a great multitude, women, not a few, a lot of folks. He was winning people to the Lord everywhere Paul went. He left behind a trail, didn't he, of new converts. What kind of trail do you leave behind you? Recently, as a congregation, we all together quoted that lovely Psalm 23. And one of the phrases that we said together was, Surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow me. What kind of trail do you leave? What follows you? Is it turmoil and conflict that follows you everywhere you go with a victim's mentality? Pass that on down to the kids and down a few generations. And what happens? We have a world that's upside down that needs turned right side up. A negative spirit. We can leave foul footprints everywhere we go. Brighten rooms just by leaving them. What do you leave behind in your workplace each day when you leave it? What do you leave behind at the dinner table when you get up from it? What do you leave behind when you leave any public place, the beauty shop? And by the way, what is it about a beautician's chair that brings out the stupid in people? The barber's chair. Dump your whole life story on this poor worker. They're a captive audience and leave them with your burdens. Do the chemicals seep through your scalp or something? What happens? What do we leave behind everywhere that we go? What kind of trail? In his walk, Paul left behind quite a trail of people who got saved. And we'll never turn our world right side up with a critical, angry, negative spirit. If we want to turn our world right side up, here's the key. Let people see Jesus in you. And Jesus, though he did get angry a few times, really had a kind and gentle and meek spirit. Exemplify the Savior in your worship, in your walk. I heard about a little girl in Sunday school. Her teacher asked her to recite the books of the New Testament. And she said, oh, teacher, I don't know if I can say them all. But I know it starts with Matthew and it ends with revolution. She wasn't far off because Jesus will revolutionize your life. He will turn your life upside down. And what he does for you, he'll do for others. He'll turn our families right side up. He'll turn our children right side up. Our finances, our job, our, our co-workers, our relatives, our neighbors... 
It all begins when we get saved. So he exemplified the Savior. That was number one. And he explained the scriptures, number two. Um, let's look more carefully at verses two and three at how Paul explained the scriptures. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them in three Sabbath days, reasoned, here's the part, part to focus on, reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging. So look, reasoning, opening, and alleging things. Everywhere Paul went, he had the Savior in his heart and the Bible in his hand, opening it, opening and alleging. Now during this week, open your Bible, <laughs> open and allege and explain. It wasn't his persuasive salesmanship. It wasn't his personality plus that won people. He wasn't much to look at. The Bible makes it clear. He wasn't using pop psychology either, just trying to help people socially. It wasn't psychology that Paul did. You hear about the guy who said he spent four years at the Harvard Psychology Department? Somebody said, oh, you studied psychology? He said, nope, they were studying me. It wasn't pop psychology that Paul was doing. He was preaching the word. And there's power in that word. Those three things he did. He reasoned. Let's look at that one first. The word reason there is the Greek word dialegomai. Does that make you think of a word? Dialegomai. He started a dialogue. He was conversing. He was answering questions. It was a two-way street. He would hear where they were coming from. Look over, you're in chapter 17. Would you look at chapter 18, please? Turn a page to the right right now. Chapter 18 and verse number 4 at Corinth. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Look down in verse 19. Chapter 18, verse 19. We're in Ephesus. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and what? Reasoned with the Jews. Dialegomai. He was reasoning with them, conversing with them, answering questions. One of the best tools any of us can have in our bag is to be able to discuss and answer people's questions from life. People have questions. Questions about the Word. Questions about the Lord. They have questions, and if we're believers, we ought to have some answers. And unlike back in school, we're supposed to share our answers now. 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Wouldn't you love to be there and hear Paul do this? Answer the questions that were asked. He's convincing these Jews that this Jesus is their long-awaited Messiah. Now, I know we don't have a whole lot of Jews in our area. Thank God for a Jew saved in our congregation just last year. Praise the Lord, or earlier this year, whenever that was. But let's pretend we lived in those days. He's dealing with Jews. What would be the questions that they would ask a lot of? Probably about the Messiah. If he's our Messiah, then why did he die on a cross? If he's the coming king the promised one, why is he going to die on a cross? This had to be a Jewish question. Now, what if you lived in those days and you were asked that question? What about today, this week, if you were asked this question? Why did Jesus, the Messiah, die on a cross? And all you've got to use is your Old Testament. What would you say? See, they've got questions, and we need to have answers. Isaiah 53 actually says... He was wounded for what? Our transgressions. So what's the reason that he died on a cross? That, this one answers the question. For our transgressions. He was bruised for what reason again? For our iniquities. Um, There's quite a bit in your Old Testament 
about Jesus and the cross. Psalm 22, verse 7. It says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Remember, that's just what they said on the cross. If you're really him, you could come down. They shoot out that lip. Psalm 22 and verse 14. I don't know, Jacob, if I gave him these verses. Probably not. Psalm 22, 14. A, prof- a messianic psalm says, I am poured out like water. A picture of Jesus on the cross. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. A couple verses later, dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Then it says this, they pierced my hands and my feet. They had questions and he had answers. And I bet he used these verses. Two verses later in Psalm 22, they part my garments among them. They cast lots upon my vesture. Our missionary to the Jews a few months ago used these passages and had the privilege of leading a Jew to becoming a Messianic Jew, a a born-again, Bible-believing Jew. A Jew could ask, what's all this about a resurrection? Let's say he had to die, but what is the resurrection then about? What would you say to that question? You've got your Old Testament. Psalm 1610, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. It's the resurrection predicted in Psalms. Then Paul concludes dramatically with verse 3. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs, we're in chapter 17, verse 3, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And verse 4 says, some of them believed. Praise the Lord for some who will believe. It's not going to be all. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. They've got questions. We need to have the answers. Study. Have daily devotions. Go to Sunday school. Be empowered by the word. We'll study and go deeper on Wednesday night. I invite you to come. So he reasoned. That was letter A. Letter B, he opened. You see that in verse 4? He opened or verse 3, he opened, explaining what it meant. Opening their eyes is the idea. Illustrating, like parables like Jesus used. And the light goes on, ding, and people understand. Opening, let her see, alleging. Verse 3 says he alleged. The word there literally means to lay alongside of. He was taking the Old Testament and laying it beside Jesus and alleging. Here it is. For instance, he could show them Micah 5, 2. Thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. He could show them that Micah said it'll be Bethlehem, and then lay alongside that, alleging, isn't that where Jesus was born, Bethlehem? Yeah. Did you choose where you were born? Nobody chooses where they were born. Some people choose where they give birth, but that baby didn't choose where they were going to be born. How could this happen? The Old Testament said Jesus would come from the tribe of Judah. Isaiah predicts it would be by a virgin and 300 more prophecies, building a case, opening and alleging, lay alongside of. And this is how we turn people's world right side up. Can I give you a powerful illustration of this. I love this one because if you know me, you know I just hate evolution, this fairy tale for adults that's turning our young people away from the Lord. Well, Charles Darwin, known as the father of evolution, he visited a lot of remote places looking for what he believed in his heart, looking for evolution and progress. And he once visited a remote Pacific island in search of evidence, and he found a people there so uncivilized that he predicted these people are still evolving. They are proto-humans. They're they're not 
fully human yet because they were just so, in his words, ape-like. He predicted that they were still evolving, and he said it's going to take many, many millennia for them to come to live like a normal human and wash and eat and behave and think like normal humans. And he went back to that island just a few years later, and to his astonishment, they'd been made over, unrecognizable, civilized. And he said, what happened? And the people said, the missionaries came. <laughs> well, call it evolution if you want, but I call it revolution. <laughs> And turning their world upside down. Paul exemplified the Savior and explained the scriptures. And we must extend the salvation with an invitation. Paul gave an invitation so they could respond. We give invitations so people can respond. Because people don't just need to be stirred. They need to be changed. How are you going to respond now? We invite you to make a decision to do something about it. That's what this altar is for. Many people brought their burdens this morning and laid them on the altar and left them there symbolically going back to their seats. And some still today ask, why do you put people on the spot? People don't want to be put on the spot. Well, listen, we don't want to offend but let me just say kindly but clearly, we all need to be on that spot. We need to be put on that spot. And then the Holy Spirit knocks on the door, on the spot, and then the ball is in their court. And when they say yes, as some did in our text, they believe, and their world is turned upside down. You know, they meant it as a criticism, as they said, these that have turned the world upside down. But those who got saved said, yep, my world was turned upside down. And I'm happy about it. Let's pray.